I, I just uh, redid my talk this morning and I realized it's awfully long and so um, I'm, I'm going to move fairly quickly through the beginning part because I want to get to the bears and the wolves. Um, we do talk about them throughout the talk but uh, my, I begin in a particular place and you'll see why um, as we go through. But just to let you know and I'll be explaining the title as we go through as well. This is um, a photograph from uh, the Swiss Shack in Katmai in Alaska, and um, that's a female grizzly. And this is where we were camping, and it was a beautiful evening, and it was a, a beautiful trip. So we'll, we'll eventually get there, but we've got some other other stuff to cover beforehand. I like to start with this slide because I think it gives us all a sense of perspective. Um, here we are, right? Here we are. And uh, it's a lot of space out there. And, you know, we're in a little bit of a problem, right? We, we kind of decided that we're not really part of that, right? Not only are we not part of that, but we're in charge. Um, and it's for our use. And it's causing us some trouble. And I'm not going to get into all the philosophical and the ethical issues behind that and how we got here and which cultures, Western European in particular, really developed. Um, particular philosophy that's really pushed the world in that direction. But I'd like to start there just to get us some perspective. Um, and I just have a quick little story. I was reading, I don't know if any of you get National Geographic, but I do, and a few, I think it was one issue or two issues ago, uh, it was called Are We Alone? And I don't know if anybody saw that one. It's great. I love, it reminds me of your class, John, when I sat in on your class, you talked about how great space exploration is, and it's fascinating, and oh my goodness, all this stuff we're learning out there. But I couldn't help but wish for those planets that we were looking for to hide behind their stars. You know, God, don't let us find them. You know, we're really not ready. We can't even take care of the one we've got. So um, that's sort of where we're, where we're moving from. And I think that uh, we, have a bit of a, we have a bit of a problem. And uh, Barry Le Lopez talks about it this way. This is from his book, or uh, an essay called um, uh, The Passing Wisdom of Birds. And he writes, the, and, and there's many people, many people have said this in many different ways, but he writes, the question before us is how do we find a viable natural philosophy? He's a natural ph philosophy person, so that's how he's going to articulate it. One that places again within the elements of our natural history. And then he goes on to say, the solutions to our plight, and he's talking about our separation now, um, as well as what we've done through, to the entire planet, I think is likely to be something no other culture has ever thought of. Something over which the Ikung, the Inuit, the Navajo, the Walbubri, I say that quickly because I'm not sure if I say that right, um, <laughs> and the other traditions we have turned to for wisdom in the 20th century will marvel at as well. And I, 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 I put in ITALS um, something no other culture has ever thought of. Because I think that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I don't think I know that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. This idea that the solutions, or solution, has something to do with something that we can't quite get our minds around yet. We can't quite imagine. There's, we sort of see it pop up, right, from time to time, but we really don't seem to have, some might call it the consciousness, the awareness, and we're, we're going to all those words. But I'm wondering if anybody um, knows the response. He, when, uh, Barry Lopez does say that there's an answer. And I'm wondering if anybody knows, if you've read it, you probably can't say, but take a guess. What do you think maybe he offered as the answer to this plight? Anybody want to take a stab? No? I know, I hate it when people do that when they're talking. Well, it's an interesting answer. He answers with wild animals. and I read that, and it was sort of a cone for me for a while. I read through and saw what he said, and, and then had a better clarity and understanding, but I'm wondering if anybody wants to venture as to why he said that. Why he thought it would lie with wild animals. Because it's natural. Yeah. With caution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other ideas? I mean, just go for it. You know, you don't have to be right. There's no right answer. Ha! There's nothing like it when there's no right answer. Yeah? Because it's, uh, because without a uh, the sense of the human ethics and uh, and desires and goal orient uh, goals um, other species have the 
have a more sort of uh, basic uh, and less, or rather, not uh, less propensity to over uh, to overwhelm mm -hmm. the system. Yeah, you know, I think you're. I think you're. You're both getting getting somewhere near. What he really. What he. What he what he's saying is that when we're in relationship to wild animals, and the reason he uses wild is it's this idea of self-willed, that it's a being that is its own being, that we're in relationship to that. Something happens inside of us. We're taken to a place, and he uses the word metaphysical, and we're going to talk a little bit about that word a bit later, but he, he, he says that when we're in their presence, and particularly over a prolonged period of time, something happens inside of us. Something else gets developed. We get in touch with something that transcends just the literal. And so, so that's, that's basically his point. And we'll get, I, as I said, I have a few too many slides here, so we, oh, okay, that's the quote there, or the citing. And this is from another Barry, Wendell Barry. I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. And this is another way of saying the same thing. So, so just hold that idea of the animals for a second there. I think the present system can correct itself only by conscientiously trying to include what it has so far excluded, which of course would make an entirely different system with entirely different claims. So that's, the, I just use these two in there. Like I said, you know, there's lots of people who said this in many different ways from, from very far back. But I just wanted to use these two quotes to help us get our minds around this idea that probably the answer to the troubles that we have today are beyond what we can conceive right now. And I think this is what these two gentlemen are, are saying to us. And Wendell Berry goes on and points us back to the natural world too, the way Barry Lopez did. But not everybody agrees. and Other people have different ideas. And um, this quote, which I would love to know if anybody knows who wrote this, the world henceforth will be run by synthesizers. People will be able to put together the right information at the right time, think critically about it, and make important choices wisely. Doesn't that sound good? It's really tight. Everything's going to be all right. Literally a jumping together of knowledge by linking the linking of facts and fact-based theory across disciplines to create a common groundwork of explanation. So what's this guy saying? This person. What's this person saying? going to be all right, right? It's going to be tidy. It's going to be neat. We're going to just keep doing what we're doing. We're going to get our facts, and we're going to get them in line, and we're going to create things. They're going to help us figure it out. Does anybody know who wrote this? I'll give you a hint. He's a, he's a Harvard professor, and he's really well known. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's from Consilience, <laughs> which put Wendell Berry into a conniption. Um, but it's an interesting thing to come from a person who is so such a studier of the natural world and has, got, has brought us so much. It's an interesting thing and we'll talk a little bit more about what that might be about. Here's another person who's very well known. I don't know how many of you know of um, Alexander Christopher. Familiar with him? He's a fabulous guy. He wrote a book called The Pattern Language. John, you're probably familiar with him. He wrote a uh, wonderful book called The Pattern Language. If you ever build a house, I highly recommend it. He really has this wonderful heart, great sense of um, he's, a, he's an architect and uh, really has a great sense of form. He just wrote these four huge books called, called The Order of Nature. Like it's his magnum opus. But this is his conclusion of this incredible study of the nature of order. There's a logical and empirical thread of argument which does establish the necessity for new views of ourselves in relation to the world, could even shed light on the way wholeness occurs in the universe in a sufficiently concrete fashion that we may help, help find help wrestling with the question of God, the nature of the concept. It might even give us a path to our own access to that mystery, yet couched in acceptable and concrete and scientific terms of reference, or scientific reference, terms of scientific reference. So what I'm trying to do is set us up to have an understanding of something before we get to the animals. What I'm trying to say is, there's some people out there, many people, many different traditions, of which I am not that well versed in, who are saying it's something very different. Something very different. It's beyond our imagination. And we've got to look to the natural world to help us cultivate an understanding of it. And then you've got the other camp, which tends to be a more of, of our world, right? It's, it's that just keep going. We're going to find the answers. Just keep with the right system, and we'll keep working it, and we will. what we don't know yet, we will. And I think the, these words are important, couched. So it implies comfort, right? 
he's couched, <laughs> you know, and accept and it's acceptable. We don't make any waves, right? Nothing gets too messy. It's concrete, it's nice and firm, and it's all going to be all right. And I think the reality is, is that um, it's not going to be comfortable, people. And I think we learn this as we work with the animals. Um, so I want to work a little bit with this slide to help us get a, get a sense of these two different ideas and these two different perceptions. And there's so much that goes into this, and it's, it's hard to sort of summarize it quickly, but I don't know if anybody sees anything in that image that they recognize, any other symbol that's fairly well known in the world. Yin and yang. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what's another for yin and yang? What are the, what are the other opposites? Light and dark. Yeah. Hot and cold. Mm-hmm. What was the other one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, exactly, that whole idea that we've got, you know, form and essence, we could call it concrete and um, corporal. Uh, uh, some call it, you know, return. And what is it? That's, a, that's an Eastern philosophy return and essence and return or something. But basically, I think what I'm trying to help us see is that we have this, right? And this list goes on, but we have this very rational, very deductive concrete. This is the world of the concrete. And I call this slide and and as well as. And this is a really important point um, that we're going to work through the whole talk on. I'm not saying either or. I'm not saying this is bad and this is good. I'm saying we have to be thinking along these lines of its both, right? And this is the whole understanding, which, John, this is your area, not mine, the Eastern philosophy of the yin and the yang, right? That, that there's a constant coming together. And it's why I love this photograph. I just happened to snap this photograph off the boat in Alaska. Um, that it really gives the fluidity sense to it, right? It's water and, and things are, I don't know if you've seen them. It doesn't work that way. You know, there's this, this sort of milkiness here, and, and there's a little bit over here, which, which of course, you know, it evokes that symbol with, with the dark and the light is in, in the, the opposites. But I think it represents something. Um, but, but let's talk for a second about what's the other side. So, so, okay, we know this side, right? We know it well. This is the side that we've been steeped in. This is, this is how we grow up. This is how we learn to understand the world. What, what's the other side? The spirit. Okay, yeah. The deep intuitive. side, the spirit. The deep side, yeah. Intuitive. Intuitive, yeah. Inductive. Hmm? Inductive. Okay, yeah, yeah, the opposite of deductive. It gets kind of tough, like, okay, well, well rational, what is, what's the opposite of rational? Hmm? Emotional. Yeah, emotional. Um, it's, you know, you can't, if you say irrational, right, that kind of, uh, sends you off in a, in a particular direction of negativity, right? Well, these, this side I'm calling the aesthetic and creative perception side, or the sensuous. And I don't know, how many of you read um, David Abrams' Bell, The Sensuous? Okay, so some of you are familiar with this, his work. His work, um, uh, a lot of people talk about it as aesthetic perception. Um, Abrams brings in the idea that it's sensuous, that it's of the body, that it's corporal. Um, I use the word creative, and Bill Carpenter isn't here tonight, but we had a, we had a conversation about it because he uses aesthetic, and I also use creative because I think aesthetic is somewhat limited. Um, but this is some of what we, we just talked about. We, we didn't say imagination and dreams, but that's also the world. Um, and emotion. And then I'm adding three things here, and these are... I think ways of thinking, ways of perceiving that help us understand this world. Um, in, in alchemy we call this the union of the opposites, the yin and the yang. And what happens with the union and the opposites is that a third entity gets born, a third way that you can't conceive of, that's unconscious. And I think that's what we're talking about today and that's what we're looking at. And my question was, as I got to learn these things, I had a couple questions, but primarily the big question was, how do we bring this out into the natural world? And um, there's a couple quotes I want to give you to talk, to just frame our minds around these things before we move on. One's from Keats, and it's, all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy. And what he's saying there, does anybody want to, well, why don't you tell me what he's saying there? <laughs> 
Does anyone want to take a stab at that? All charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy. Who said that? Keats. Keats. Well, what he's saying is that this is the realm of the ineffable, like this lady said. It's the realm of what we call the spirit. And I, I shy away from those words primarily because they're so loaded. And when we start to say the word soul or spirit, we start to go, and in some ways we have some real reason to do that, right? We have this whole problem of fundamentalism that really gets us a little scared of what that means. The, what you've said about the, this world um, is that this is the world of psyche, and this is ultimately an ineffable world. And the word psyche, are you all familiar with the word psyche and what it means? Okay, well, you know, I, can you? <laughs> I can't define it, but I can tell you a little bit about where it lives, I think. It lives in the ineffable. It lives in the in, inscrutable. It lives in the mystery. And so, to come to know it, we have to develop something very different than what we've developed to know this. And I think this is one of our issues, is that we are kind of retarded in a way. <laughs> We've, we're a culture that developed this way of seeing the world and decided that this was the way to see the world. And we left this one out. Mm -hmm. And not only did we leave it out, but we said it wasn't real and we said it wasn't very good and we denigrated it and we desecrated it, right? And now we're starting to realize that, geez, you know, we actually got to figure this out. My sense is that this is a practice. This is something we have to develop. And of course, I didn't come up with that idea of myself. Um, it's a very old idea. Um, and it's how I got connected with John. As I started to learn about these things, I started to step into the world of Eastern philosophy, um, which is steeped in all of this idea of developing these two things. I want to give you one last quote, though, that I really like, which is um, from a woman named Eva Ensler. You all probably know her from the Vagina Monologues. She just came out with a new book. It's called I'm an Emotional Creature. And this is from a poem. I am an emotional creature. Things do not come to me as intellectual theories. They pulse through my organs and legs and burn up my ears. And what she's saying here is that there's a way to know the world. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not presenting this. This is the and and as well as slide. We need both. But we need to figure out how to bring this side up, think to this side and we need a particular practice. And one of the pieces that's very important in this is understanding, I believe, is understanding human consciousness, and, and particularly the human unconscious. And I wanted to use this, I'm gonna, I don't know if any of you have seen this, there's an article in National Geographic, this, this one's on wolves, right? The Wolf Wars. I think it's a good article. How many of you read this article? Has anyone seen this? Oh, look at that, how cool. So I think it's a good one, and I think it's very well written, and he has, does a good job of putting things forth. I love the photo, uh, the drawing of Yellowstone before the wolves and after the wolves. I mean, that's just fabulous. It's such a great thing to, to, to just, what's the right word? Bring that to light in that way um, through a drawing. But what he says in the end, I take a little bit of issue with. I take issue with the title, too, the idea that it's a war. And in a sense, it is. But he says in the end, we cannot. We need to not look at the wolf of the mind. We need to look at the real wolf. I don't know if you remember that in the conclusion, right? We need to look at the wolf, real wolf and not the wolf of the mind. And when I was studying wolves, because I did my thesis at Oxford in, uh, in wolves, and that's how I got started in doing what I'm doing today. And I actually got very interested in, and how I got here today, is I got started to look at this the metaphor, metaphorical, the mythological, and the symbolic, because it was such an important part. And I disagree with this author that we need to not look at that. I think we need to look at the wolves in here and the wolves out there, because I don't think that we're going to come to coexistence if we don't begin to honor both. Because basically, what does he say? He's saying, let's just stay out here. Stay here where it's comfortable and it's clear. We're just going to educate people. We're going to get there. We're going to figure it out. And I'm saying, no, I think, I'm sorry, we're going to have to go to this ineffable, murky, difficult place and try to figure out how to bring that in as well. How are we doing on time? We're doing all right. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about this or wants to have any comments about this or thoughts. Does this image work for you? 
it should be perfectly natural. You mm -hmm. shouldn't have to study about it. It's there in all of us. Yeah, but I think as a culture, it's been so repressed that we, I think we have to do some work. And I also, I don't know if I fully agree because I think it's also deep work. Um, I think it's a very deep work. I don't think it just comes that easily. I think it's, um, I'm not going to say it right, Ching Tuz, C H U N U A N G, Chang Tuz. Chong Tuz. Yeah, that one. <laughs> 75 years. This is um, one of the great Eastern sages, one of the great, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm just learning about him. 75 years. Rilke says, in the artist's life, 10 years is nothing. And what they're talking to about is that this is incredible work, and it takes a lot of time um, to cultivate this side, that side. Um, that was a thing on, on um, aesthetic. Um, but back to this idea of, of, of the wolf wars. I think what I had uncovered in my work in studying wolves was, was this piece as well. Not just the biology, not just how do we make it function, but this piece. Because this really seemed, as I said earlier, really seemed to have an incredible influence in what we were thinking and feeling. And I love this quote from Jung. It's actually from a video. And he says, the unconscious is really unconscious. <laughs> so it's stuck in my mind. And does anybody want to venture to say what he was saying? What did he mean, the unconscious is really unconscious? You can't, can't rationalize um, the, uh, the under layers of your, uh, the deeper layers of your unconscious. You can, you can delve into it and analyze it, but you can't really, you can't grasp at the whole thing. You can't uh, establish this is this, and this is this, and this is this. It's a, it's a lot of, them. Uh, it's a very murky subject to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely, and I think the other reality is that, is that what he means, too, is that the unconscious is really unconscious. When we, um, that's really clear, isn't it? When we, <laughs> um, when we create a painting like this, or when we look at a painting like this, or a drawing like this, um, something is going on here, right? This, this, this is actually telling us something about how we feel about this particular animal. Um, this, in, in particular, is, is interesting because the wolf is actually not really a wolf, right? It's kind of a wolf, but it's also, what do you guys see? Dragon. Dragon. A dragon. But look at this. This is interesting, too, right? This is like a, a knight's... Snake. Snake. Oh, you see a snake. Interesting. Yeah, I see sort of this, that thing that, that warriors wear. Um, and the damsel, well, <laughs> she's not doing so well, is she? So... The idea behind this is that there's a lot more that we bring to our, that we project, is a word that you use, that we project, because we don't have a conscious understanding um, of what we really are, are experiencing and feeling, and so we project it out there, and we in particular project it out there onto the animals, and the wolf is probably one of the animals that we've projected the most on. And that's what happened to me when I started to study them. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And what was more phenomenal was this is really fascinating, right? These all these fairy tales and these myths. They're they're ways to help us access. Um, I was afraid I might forget to say, say this. They tell us about that which is not readily available to us. Okay? They bring us to places that we can't really like you're trying like you were saying, can't quite get there on our own. They help us get there and in a way it's not what's accessible to the rational mind, as that young man was saying. They lead us there. And this says a lot about a culture, about a perspective. Um, I love the bonnet on the wolf. I mean, this is fabulous. <laughs> he was looking good, but not anymore. And so here's another one. You know, what do you see? You can say it. He looks terribly scary, right? Well, when I was working and doing my thesis in, in the Alps, people were certain that the wolves were evil. It wasn't, oh no, I just am projecting my concept of evil onto them. No, no, no. These animals are evil. And if we'd like to think that today that's not the case, I hate to break it to you, but it's still there. And this is one of the reasons I say that we've got to work on this other piece of understanding 
when we're looking at the big animals or any part of nature as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think it helps us because if we can start to have this conversation, we can start to recognize that what we see here is also about ourselves. And it's not as much as saying, oh, well, that's not there. Which probably isn't. It really is projection. But to help us understand our feelings about it and our emotions about it and to help us have a different relationship towards these animals. Um, and this is just another couple images to sort of modern day, more modern day images. Um, this is the wolf hunts in Alaska. Um, I don't know if anybody knows how those are done these days. Um, I have a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. How can you consider the animal, how can you consider having a relationship if you feel that the animal is evil? Well, exactly. That's exactly it. Well, you can. You can have a relationship to evil. Many people do. Um, some people seek it out. But <laughs> I can't consider any animal evil. Right. But that's the reality is you can't. But many, many people do. And when I was doing my research, that's what I stumbled upon. I was like, oh my gosh, people think, they think this? I thought we just needed to figure out how to get them, how to, how to, get them to sh fence their sheep off and get a dog and we'd be all set. But it wasn't about that. You could give them all the tools they wanted, they had in the world to protect their sheep. They weren't going to do it because they had this perception. Or they would do it, but they would still maintain that. Um, and so the wolf hunts in Alaska are just kind of heartbreaking. They chase them down with the planes. Um, the pilots don't tend to like the people to shoot out of the plane because, you know, they could miss and blow up the plane. Um, so they chase them down. And when they're really fully exhausted, of course, it depends on how deep the snow is, then they jump out and they shoot the wolf. And they've got their wolf and they're happy. Um, but the question is, instead of, you know, I can get a, uh, I don't like it, obviously, that, that shows. But I think the important question is, what's going on? Why are we doing this? And why do we do this? And this is something that's going on today. I don't know if anybody shop at Cabela's, but they're one of the happy supporters of the Predator Derby. This is something that uh, takes place now. And now wolves have been included. This is obviously coyote. Um, but wolves are also now included. It's within the law because they, they stay within the limits of what they're allowed to kill. Um, and I use this slide just to show you something. It's the middle one that I love. And it's to just reiterate my point that, you know, we've got all this data and this information. Here's this person saying, it was never home to the wolf. I mean, what, where's, what planet has this person been on? Right? And all these other people who like, helped her make the sign. Um, so my point here is, is that there's something else going on, and we have to address that. And I love the next one, too. Hear the bloody scream of wildlife and fight the wolf reintroduction. So this is all this piece of consciousness, um, and working the consciousness, and working our consciousness and our unconscious projections onto these animals. And that's just, these are just to reiterate that. Um, and this is as well. That something else is going on. It has to do with the human oh, unconscious. I'm not going to get into the details of what, what all the things that you said about that. Um, but here, this is, this is today, people. This is out there today. And, you know, it's easy to be judgmental, right? Ah, this one kills me. But I have to ask, what's going on here? Look how happy they are. Well, two of them. <laughs> right? You know, maybe the third because he's gone. But, um, you know, they're happy. And, you know, this brings up the question of the ego. Um, and the question of what is the trophy hunt? What is this about? What is this of our culture? How does this connect back to this issue of this very materialistic, dominionistic, utilitarian um, understanding of the world? So that's just to frame, to frame that piece, and just so we don't think that it's all about negativity, the unconscious is also something that projects a lot of positive things. Um, and ours, what the unions call, they call it a positive shadow. And the idea is, is that, you know, and I saw this when I was doing my work on the wolves too, and you see it in the bear world. Um, oh, they're perfect, wonderful, harmless beings that, you know, they're almost godlike. And, and, and really it's a disrespect, I think, to the animal. It's again this projection of ourselves out there. It's not really understanding the animal for the animal for what it is. And this is um, a bear called Melissa. Mama Melissa and her two cubs, Hope and Scrap, Scrappy and Hope. Um, and these are two or three animals that I spent some time with this summer in uh, the cat mine. Um, and one last piece, and so basically 
I'm looking at three, we're looking at three things. We're looking at creative perception, aesthetic, sensuous perception, how we perceive. We're looking at consciousness, the unconscious, how we work that. And we're looking at this final thing called um, contemplative inquiry. It's been put together by this man named Arthur Zions. He calls it the epistemology of love. And what's important to see is that we're talking about to come to this other understanding, to begin to work this other side, right? The, remember the side with the, the yin-yang side. To work the yin side, to work the essence side in relation to the form. I think we need these three things. So we need that the work of perception, we need the work of consciousness, and we need this idea of contemplative inquiry. They, and they go like this. They overlap each other. They're not distinct, um, distinct fields by any means. I'm going to move really quickly through here so we can get to the animals. Zions um, builds his theory on Goethe's idea of delicate imperialism. And I'm just going to put these up and we'll go through them really quickly. This idea is that, because the thing is, I'll just back up for a second. I think one of our problems is those of us who are interested in this sensuous piece, right, this sensuous realm, how do I bring my emotions and my intuition, my imagination? How do I work the world of dreams? And how do I bring this into my relationship to the natural world? And how does it get validated? You know, how do we actually really make it happen? How do we bring it forth? Um, and so this is why I think what Zions is doing is very important, because he gives us a way to take these ideas and take these issues and bring them out into the world. He gives us sort of a formula, if you will. And so he, he was based on Goethe's work. And Goethe said, there is a delicate empiricism, which makes itself utterly identical with the object, thereby becoming true theory. By this, but this enhancement of our mental powers belongs to a highly evolved age. And I think that's what we're talking about today, people. We're talking about, can we reach a level of consciousness a, a, a dimension, a form of consciousness. I don't like to say higher because I think it implies this vertical axis, um, but a, a deeper, a wider consciousness. Can we get there? And can we get there in time? Um, which might not have to do with speed. The truth, true, true to the original meaning of theory, which is to behold. Okay, these are sort of my notes. But the idea is that the word theory means to behold. That's the original meaning of theory. It's the, it's the Greek meaning, okay? So the idea is, is from Goethe, and this is why I named my, my talk From Theory to Contemplation, because what he was saying is that the actual theory, and John and I were just talking about this at his office before we, before we came over here, the, the way we think about theory today is we sort of, we have an idea, and then we postulate a hypothesis, and then we go out and we try to prove it, right? But, Goethe goes back and says, no, 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 that's not real theory. Um, it's more of a practice. And then he uses this word aperçu, or seeing, rather than a, and I really can't say that word, raciocination? Raciocination. Thank you. Raciocination. Oh, I missed a letter. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I wonder it's I couldn't letter. say it. Of deductive <laughs> logic or inferential reasoning. No wonder I couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> I'm a dyslexic, by the way, so I'm actually doing really well. Um, I want to make a point about the word aperçu. It's French word, and it means to perceive. It actually doesn't mean to see. Um, and and, and uh, Zion really pretty much speaks to this. One of the other pieces that Goethe talked about is this idea that you must have prolonged, con prolonged contemplation of phenomena without theory or hypothesis. So in other words, this is really the contemplative practice. And I'm still very much, I'm sure many of you have a much deeper and more evolved a practice than I do. But um, this idea that you really let go of everything and you are present with the quote unquote phenomena. In this case, it's going to be the big animals, um, the wolves and the bears. Um, it's experiential and participatory. Through um, an intuitive perception, this is Goethe's words, an intuitive perception of eternally creative nature, we may become worthy of participating in nature's creative processes. So the idea is that nature is constantly creative. This is what nature is. It's a creative force. And that through, that this is, you know, to talk about perception, talk about contemplation, through bringing these things all together, the way we see, how we deal with theory, that we begin to have a way of actually becoming part of the natural world. And remember the globe? You know, this idea that we're separate, but really we're not. 
How do we get back in? What Barry Lopez was saying, how do we find our way back in? Um, also participatory in the sense of, you know, like I just said. Um, to apprehend and continue nature's inherent creative impulse to enhance rather than to degrade. I think this is an important line, and that's why I put it in there, is, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with an author named Matthew Fox, um, but he writes something, he, he says that we're a necrophiliac society, that we live off of death. You know, that we create this world that really lives off death. We are not doing what Goethe is trying to talk about here. Um, to enhance rather than degrade. And that we really, that's, that's our work. And my sense is that we've got to balance these two ways. We've got to get to that balance and come to that third unknown way that the bringing together of these two sides actually creates. So um, I'm going to move through these because we're running out of time. Um, this is, uh, and these are, these are important pieces, and I love to, if people are interested, I'd love to talk about them later, this the fact that it's an individual path, these are basically the things you sort of need, um, how you get to this idea of a conscious relationship, an intentional stance with the natural world, and the idea that there's a mystery, that the other is a mystery. When you withdraw your projections, you begin to experience the other as mystery, and that is a very important piece, to withdraw that. And it's work, it's constant work. There's a rigor to it. It's not just something that's sort of pie in the sky, oh, this is fun and easy to do. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Um, and that's why Rilke said, 10 years is nothing. And Chukyu, Ching, Chang? Chuangsu. Chuangsu. A lifetime. But it doesn't mean we can't start now. And it doesn't mean that we can't begin to really develop a different form of perception. So these are the pieces of, of the elements. And I'm not going to stop here because I want to get to the animal. But respect and restraint, gentleness, gentleness, intimacy, vulnerability, participation, education as formation. This is very important. Because what Goethe is saying, which is, I know in many other texts as well, and it's why I, I like to study with John because I, I know I have a lot to learn about where else these things have been said. But this idea that when you do this kind of experience of the world, when you bring this kind of work and this kind of rigor, this contemplative practice, these forms of perception, these aesthetic forms of perception, and you work them with a work of your own, of having a consciousness of your, what you're projecting out there, um, your ego, all of those things, you actually begin to develop other, form, other organs of perception. I think what he's saying is you begin to develop other forms of consciousness. And I think that's basically what we're talking about. So the question is, and this sort of insights a, um, just a, a summary of all that. So the question I had was, okay, ah, oh, this stuff is great, and I love reading it. No oh, man, in winter, in Maine, it's fantastic, and you know I can spend all night doing it. But how does it? How do you bring it into the world, right? Because it's abstract still, right? It's still kind of up there in the ethers, and so. I started to look around for examples of individuals and peoples who've act peoples, people who've actually been doing this in the world. And I have to tell you tonight that I am not really the example you want to hear about, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine. I'm going to show you some pictures of the inside passage, and I'm going to show you some pictures of the cat mine and some bears out there and tell you my stories. But I'm going to end with a couple other people's stories because those stories are really the people who have spent 15, 20, 30, one man in particular who spent 70 years, Charlie Russell. Um, uh, practicing more or less what we're talking about, not in a conscious way though, um, but they've moved from their hearts. They've said, God, there's got to be another way to know the world. There's got to be another way to know animals. I, 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 you know, I want knowledge, but I want it from another form. And they just moved in this direction and they've discovered some extraordinary things that have really helped us, I think, move towards the idea of coexistence. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about them, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about my trip. I took the inside passage, I took a boat, and the reason I took the boat is I wanted to slow down. As you can tell, I'm a pretty hyper person. I don't slow down very easily. And so I got on a boat, left the computer behind, left all the, well, I took the camera, um, and I took the cell phone, but I told people this didn't work, which wasn't true. Um, and I took, and you take, I took the boat, the inside passage, up the inside passage, and uh, stopped in, and Juno went out to Sitka to meet Richard Nelson, who some of you may know is a really fabulous naturalist, wonderful man, I had a great time with him. Then I went up to Haines, hitchhiked out and down to Homer to the bear boat, flew out to uh, my, meet my first person I was going out with, and we went out here to the Katmai National Park Preserve. And this is, if, how many of you are familiar with Timothy Treadwell? We can talk about him. 
Uh, he's known as the Bear Man. He's been made notorious by uh, uh, Warner Herzog, and uh, not really totally fair representation of that man. Um, oh, and this is just to give you, I don't know if you can see this. The first place I went is up there. It's called Swiss Shack Bay. I spent three weeks camping up there. You can see that the river's very braided there. Um, and what's happening is the bears are going up there to get sedge um, before the salmon run. When they come out of their dens, I'm in June, so let me tell you the time of day that it helps them go up. I went up in June. Um, the bears are coming out of their dens. The bay moms are coming out with the cubs. They keep very far away in general because the males, sometimes females, but primarily males are predatory. Um, and they do uh, eat the babies sometimes, if they've learned how to do that, I guess. So that's where I was first. Second place I was is here, Hollow Bay. Um, so I take off from uh, Bellingham, Washington on the ferry. And uh, it was just a fabulous, fabulous ride. And one thing I want to say very quickly is I met a really fantastic uh, couple on the ferry. This guy was a farmer. And I've done a lot of work in agriculture. And uh, so we got talking about sustainable ag and all that kind of stuff. And we, had the, we got talking about slowness. And we got talking about how ridiculous it is to think that we can have a slow food movement without a slow world. Or a slow food movement in a fast world, right? The, 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 that there's a disconnect and that we've got to start thinking much more about bringing that concept of slowness into everything. Um, so this is what we were practicing slowness. We were just moving through this beautiful country. Um, it's very surreal, very beautiful. Start to get, this is actually BC, British Columbia. Um, the photo's not that clear, but moving up through British Columbia. When I got off to go see Richard Nelson, I spent some time alone in the woods. And I came across my first kill. Um, I've been in grizzly bear alone before, grizzly bear country alone before. Uh, this was a more disconcerting trip. Um, a lot of thick forest. I was in open land before. And we can talk about that if we want to. Um, I really want to open it up to questions, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. Um, then we move up through. This is our plane. This is a pretty famous pilot. He is the pilot who dealt with Timothy Treadwell and found him. Um, his name's Willie. He's a fantastic pilot. Uh, really, really fun. And, this is where we fly out. We fly out from Kodiak out into the Katmai. Uh, this is the peninsula over here. You see the peninsula here, and then it goes back in there. That's the river where we were, the Swiss Shack, for the first three weeks. This is the Swiss Shack that's already coming around there. You have, you have it. Uh, beautiful uh, tidal river. And these are the flats where the bears live, or come out. I should say they come out here. And so what did we do? For three weeks, I went with a, uh, I accompanied a, uh, a biologist, photographer, really taught me a lot about bear manners. He was pretty much a bear himself. I didn't really enjoy his presence, but I did learn a lot from him. <laughs> and it was sort of a practice, you know, withdraw my protection onto this guy that I hated. Um, <laughs> but for three weeks we sat. And he, one of the things that this man has learned, he's been out there for a long time, he really knows his stuff. You sit and you wait. You sit and you wait and they will come. And we have this incredible desire to be close to them. And I, you know, I think that's an important one to examine in depth. Um, but the reality is, is that we're like them. We're carnivores. We're curious. Part of being a carnivore is being curious. Because that's how you survive, right? That's how you find your food. And so they want to check you out. The bears in Swiss Shack are not as habituated to people as the bears in Hollow Bay. So you spend a lot of time. Practicing your sitting and practicing looking at the images that come in your mind and the fantasies and where you go and um, I do a lot of writing about that and then just trying to let them go and just be there present with the bears. Um, here's some people flew in. They do fly in from the mainland to come and watch and these people are doing it as we should. Just sit. Not everybody does. Some people run around after them which sends uh, some people into, into real fits of rage. That's a male. Yeah, that's, a big, uh, that's a big male. And you get to see a lot of wonderful things. This is a male courting, kind of. A grizzly bear courting is pretty intense. Um, it doesn't make you want to be a female grizzly bear. Uh, she's a fairly older female. Um, but this in itself, what I was trying to do is just, how do you practice these things? And like I said to you earlier, I don't really have much to tell you from my experiences. Because I'm really a beginner. What I learned is, um, is that if you stay open, you get 
a wonderful sense of peace and you get a wonderful sense of um, you want to be there more. I can't say I had, you know, some kind of enlightened experience. I didn't. I, I just don't think I'm there by any sense of the imagination. But I think there is something there. And I'll talk to you about the people that um, I think are, are showing us that. Um, this is a female finally came to sniff us out and check us out. And you can see she's not aggressive. She's just sniffing. But you still have to be vigilant. And this is one of the pieces I want to bring to you. That idea of bringing the sensuous perception, bringing the aesthetic perception. You still need that other side, right? It's not either or. It's and and as well as. And the bears really show you. There's, a, there's an expression I don't know if any of you are familiar with. It's called bear attention. B-A-R-E. And it's a, a, it's a Buddhist expression, right? And it means empty mind. I'm just really present. Well, these animals will bring you there because you need to be present and you need to be aware. You need to be aware of who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and they help you with this practice, I think, more than anything. Um, so is this so that photograph taken with a telephoto? No, a it's 55 millimeter. Okay. She was, I mean, they come right up to you. And, and a friend of mine who's a guide says, you know, he gets so frustrated with the people who come out because he feels like they're a little bit like um, uh, the trophy hunters. Everybody wants to be close. I wish we'd had more time because I got have gone through those elements that... Um, Zions has of contemplative inquiry, and one of them is this idea that um, to let go of the idea of having a product, to let go of the idea of bringing anything back, uh, data, uh, having a conclusion, and, and I know this is very much an Eastern, Eastern idea, right, that you're just there for the experience. And eventually, it's like um, the Zen Buddhists say, the painting will paint itself, the poem will write itself. And I think there's something very valid to this in relationship to the animals. So, um, and yet it's still thrilling, and you can't deny that. And I think part of the work is not to say, oh, I should or I shouldn't, because that's just another voice inside of us. It's that, wow, I'd love to be close. Why? Why do I need to be so close? Why do I need to take this photograph and bring it home and show everybody or hurry back to the Internet, put it on iPhone or iPage or I can tell I'm not doing it, right? Facebook. Um, <laughs> So, and it's still thrilling, it's still wonderful, and, and uh, she's a little nervous. She's a little nervous. Her mouth is open, and you can't see it in the photo really there, but she's drooling a little bit. And that's a bit of a sign of nervousness, but very, very, very little. And she went back out and scratched her feet. They do it a lot. It's just so cute. Um, and that's a problem too, right? Oh, it's just so cute. This is a grizzly bear. <laughs> you better have some respect. I'm giving you this photo because this is a very important photo for me. I spent, this is a lot of the place where I spent just sitting. And I wanted to sit and be there. The man that I was with wanted to go and get his photographs and go and get his data. And it was really kind of funny because the things that he wanted were bears and, bears and flowers and he wanted to get wolves and, <laughs> and all these different things he wanted to get. And what happened is I would sit there, you know, in my naive kind of self thinking, okay, I've got my flare, um, uh, which people I went with, they use flares, not spray. Um, and sometimes I'd step back into the electric fence that's around the tents if I felt nervous. It just was really, you know, I don't know these animals. I grew up with animals. And I think the thing you learn when you grow up with animals is you know when you don't know an animal and you better pay attention because otherwise you can really get hurt. And the reality is it's not ultimately about you, it's about them because they're going to get killed if they hurt you. And you're in their home. So this is a place I spent a lot of time. This was the best part, just this beauty of these hills. They were phenomenal to me. I spent, maybe it's because my last name's O'Keefe, I don't know. I spent so much time just staring at these hills and being, <laughs> being there. And great things happened for me. This wonderful female bear came. He was off, tromping around, trying to find what he needed. And I was just sitting there. And here she comes, and we sit together for hours. And I'm not, I don't chase her around. I don't try to chase her around. I'm a little nervous, right? I'm, I'm, this is new for me. Did I get an incredible poem that's going to transform your experience of life and help you learn to coexist with the natural world? No, I didn't. Maybe someday I will. But I think it's the practice that matters. And, and she was just so sweet. But something else happened to me. I have a conviction about wolves. I never wanted to see a wolf in captivity. I wanted my first wolf to be a wild wolf. I've been looking at wolves and trying to understand the whole relationship with wolves and wolves for 15, almost 15 years, no, no, not quite that long, no, 12 years. And um, here I am again, sitting, um, and the animals will go across the other side of the river there. 
they would do they would walk that side of the river up to the flats. And sometimes they would swim over, but if they did, they swam way below us. Well, this wolf decided that it was going to swim over. And uh, to make a point, you remember the picture of the wolf hanging off the plane. Now, the wolves in the parks tend to not be quite as terrified of humans, but they're still pretty darn terrified. And where they do the aerial hunting and where the Katmai is, it, it, very, very far away. Could they have gotten there? Who knows? Wonderful story by a woman named Helen Thayer, who is basically one of the people who's taken these ideas and gone out and lived with the wolves, sat with a pack of wolves throughout an entire summer with her husband and um, her dog, interestingly enough. It was a phenomenal story. Trying to let go of all theory, all pretense, all, all desire to collect anything or tell any story, just be there. Um, and she, experienced, she observed the, bear, the wolves teaching their young to look in the sky for airplanes. And she would, has anybody read that story? It's a phenomenal story. It's called Three, uh, Three Among Wolves. And the, the older wolves would, with the pups, they would, they would just try to get them to learn to look up and figure out where the airplanes are coming. And of course, the airplanes would come because they were in the area where they did aerial hunting. Um, and then everybody would run for cover. So this is to say that these wolves were very frightened of people. And I was very fortunate. And they came. Now, of course, she looks kind of skinny. It's a female. Um, and she is. June, it's been a rough winter. She's probably got a belly full of food for the babies, and they're changing their, their coats. Um, and there's so much to show you and tell you about this area. Um, and when you get tired of, you know, hanging out with bears and trying really hard, you know, it's like I remember that story you told in your class, um, John, about the, the monk who was meditating so hard, you know, and then the... Uh, <laughs> does anybody, has anybody taken that, heard that story? It's a great story. That's me. So, um, <laughs> um, you know, you wander off. The, the, the foxes are not afraid. They're not hunted. They're very accepting. You get the incredible opportunity to be very close. The mother and father would just walk right by you. You could lay at the den all day and take photographs and watch them be adorable. It was really great. And I want to say that there's a lot more beauty out there. Like, I put the, the picture of the hills in for a reason, um, but there's, you know, the, the, just the, the light, the flowers, the birds, there's, it's an amazing, amazing place. Now, this is over in the cat mine. This is Melissa, the picture you saw before, and her two little ones. And now, when we have a lot of ideas about mother grizzly bears, right? I don't know, how many are familiar with the ideas that we have about grizzly bears, mother grizzly bears? Right? The most ferocious. Don't get near them. One of the things that we're learning, or people are learning, by actually having this proximity, some of the situations really seem unacceptable. Others them, like I'm going to finish with a talk. Some people are really doing some great work. Um, we are learning a lot that what Goethe said is, um, you know, you can learn a lot by finding about a person by when you know when they go to the bathroom and uh, where they eat and what they eat and how they sleep, but you're not going to really learn about the person, right? To know the essence of the being, you need to be with them. And this is what these people are doing, and they're really learning a lot more about these animals. One of the things that's happening is the females in the parks are beginning to really, I believe, trust. I don't think we're just talking about um, habituation, which is the word we use, or tolerance. I think these animals are really learning to trust human beings. And she uses humans because the male bears will tend to stay away if there's people. And the male bears do um, prey on these animals. And there was an amazing scene where Melissa, she's a very big, as you can see, I mean, this is the end of June. She's in fabulous shape. She's had two cubs. She's, she, knows, she knows what she's doing. Um, there's very few mothers, by the way, at this point. They don't know really what's going on. Uh, um, the, these two, we named them Scrappy and Hope. The reason we named them Scrappy and Hope is that they were nursing and they started to fight over a nipple, which they do a lot. And grizzly bear cubs, when they fight, they sound like wolverines. I mean, it's just the most horrible sound you've ever heard in your life. And so one, who I think is the one standing up, but we're not sure, um, was the one who was really fighting. And so we called him Scrappy and the other one Hope. Hope is going to stop. So that's how they got their name. But the thing is, with um, 
with this, my experience, I think, is really that, again, you, you know, this is really the experience of emotion. Your heart really goes out, right? Oh my God, they're so cute and so adorable. But you've got to pull back and give the animal the space to be its own being and to understand it from that perspective. And I think this practice helps us learn to do that, helps us be conscious of where we tend to go towards the positive or towards the negative. And this is an interesting photo. This guy's named Steven. What's happening is that he has a group of people behind him, and the little guy, they want to come right over. They want to come right over and see you. Because mama has said, hey, these people are all right. These things are all right. These, these species are all right. They're not going to hurt us. And what's interesting is Melissa is looking at the cub. She's not worried about Steve. She is perhaps understanding, perhaps not, I would say she is, um, that what's going on here. She knew, and, and sometimes we got really close. I was with a film team for a while, and these guys just want to get right up on the bears. And the, the guide had an old bleeding ulcer at the end of the summer. Because, of course, if something goes wrong, it goes drastically wrong. So there's this issue of space, which is an interesting thing to think about. There's an issue of space and respect um, that we violate because we get very comfortable. So um, I think that's where I'm going to end. I want to open it so to have some questions. I'm sorry, I know I, I went a little too, too, too long, and I apologize. Charlie Russell is a man who's been working for 70, uh, I'm sorry, 70 years with grizzly bears. Um, he's done some am amazing work. And uh, this person, along with a lot of other people, has really helped us move to this place. Um, so there are a lot of examples. And if you want to humor me, I want to read you one thing. Is that okay? Yeah? All right. Um, from another person, this is turkeys. This isn't bears or wolves. Um, but I love this, and I think it really speaks to what we're talking about. Joe Huto's story is very interesting. Uh, he's an artist. He's also a naturalist. And he had a very mechanical, very manipulative approach. He wanted to learn about turkeys. He raised them from the time they were, you know, hatched the eggs, administered drugs, very manipulative, very mechanical, wanted to just have a study. And this is the story of what happened to him. And this is part of the conclusion. And I find it very hopeful. And um, what I'm trying to do is just understand this more. Um, some days when we set out to forage, he would take the clutches of um, uh, turkeys out every day to forage. I can feel that we are not in sync, perhaps because we have not been together for some hours. There exists a kind of distance within our unspoken communication. Sometimes we find a secluded spot to sit and rest together, and then suddenly something happens. A sort of recollection of who we are occurs, and something links up. It's like an awakening. An enthusiasm wells up as we seem to remember our purpose and we begin to work together. I had been trying to articulate in my own mind all summer this phenomenon and the actual mechanics involved. I am experiencing a type of intimate communication unlike any that I have ever had. I cannot photograph this phenomenon. It is difficult to write about. Yet, it is obvious that something remarkable is occurring. So, we'll stop there. Uh, Charlie has very much a similar story, but I want to give you some time to ask me some questions. So I apologize, I went that on so far. Connection was? Hmm? What do you think that connection was? I think, uh, we didn't get to talk about the idea of individuation and the individual experience. I think it's a, not my place to really m maybe make a judgment on that. Um, I would say it's a, uh, a connection to the ineffable, connection to the, as you were saying, on that space, spirit, you can call it. Um, I, I, I think it's that, but, but I respect that each person has an individual experience, and it's not my place to pass a judgment on that. But I learn something from it, and I get inspired by it. Does anybody else have any other questions? I know you have exams and papers and all sorts of things, so I don't want to keep you. You'd be here all night with me. <laughs> yeah? Well, thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and uh, I was just reading this morning working on yeah. a paper on alchemy, actually. Oh, interesting. And, Great. Yeah. 
<laughs> and um, a meeting with union analysts yeah. who talks about a, um, a, a field or an, un, like a, an unconscious third space that develops between people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in relationship. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily romantic, right. which, but you know, I mean, that can be a pretty strong outlet for it, but just between people yeah. that sort of, it's like it contains both of their individual um, personality mm -hmm. components, but something else too mm -hmm. that like develops between people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that could also translate to something that could develop between a person and an animal? I mean, I don't know exactly what they're talking about, but I would say it's probably this idea of the essence, and we could call it an unconscious essence, and I think absolutely. One of the things that David Abrams says in The Spell of the Sensuous, and remember I said we are going to talk about metaphysical, um, he goes after this idea of the metaphysical. He goes after the, the word meta. And he says the reality is, is that when we began to withdraw the soul, spirit, um, or uh, the ineffable anima, and essence, the life, from all things except for humans, right? When everything became an object and we were the only ensouled beings, what happened is that energy and that experience had to go somewhere. So we shot it up into the sky and we shot it down into what Jung calls the unconscious psyche. And so what, what Abram says is actually it's everywhere and everything, and this is, this is something that native cultures have, I think, always experienced. I think we have different cultures who just really always experience this. I'm learning about the Eastern cultures and the Eastern philosophies. Um, I think they're talking about this as well, but perhaps not necessarily in relation to, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> um, so I think yes, absolutely, and I think it's sort of what we're talking about. Can we get back there to know that there's something there, and how do we learn, how do we cultivate it? before it's gone. Because I think it's going to completely, like uh, Barry Lopez and Wanda Barry say, it's going to change everything from how we see the world and thus how we construct the world. Anything else? Uh, the creator of the epistemology of love, I can't remember. Arthur Zions, yeah. Arthur. Um, I just, somebody was mentioning last night where in the sort of the, the, the youth of ecology, mm -hmm. um, Conclusions may have been jumped to. There was like sort of, you know, competing with the sciences of uh, physics and chemistry during, you know, this race to space where the money was going elsewhere. So yeah. to create these these foundational concepts, laws that you know are backed up by observations in the field. Mm -hmm. um, does the creator Arthur, um, in, a, in an attempt to over ramify, you know, this study, sort of? Well, it's interesting you ask that because he's actually a physicist. Yeah. He's a physicist. And he, again, it's sort of the and and as well as, rather than the either or, saying that um, you both are valid, but that we need to understand what we're doing when we're going with that mind that's looking to postulate theory and prove theory, and that we're actually projecting something, actually. We're trying to create something rather than what this young woman was talking about, experiencing the essence and, and allowing ourselves to get there. It's a much slower process. It's a much more subjective process. Yeah. So he's not saying either or, but he's saying we've got to add on, or we've got to widen. Yeah. Anybody else? Professor? Yeah, Susie, yeah, since I'm a policy one, thinking about this yeah, yeah. in terms of how you might change the way we behave. I mean, I'm just wondering from your, comparing your experience to reading about other people's experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is this something that you think that you can translate to others so they could understand and maybe you either create new metaphors or new myths that in terms of seeing the world or do people have to experience it themselves in order to have those changes occur? So do we need to take you know the, the hunters in Idaho out and have them spend the summer in Alaska or could they somehow get that from some other way? I mean, you've done both. Yeah, so yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it, because we didn't get, I, I skipped over the, remember I stopped at individual, and kind of did a little, and moved on. Um, my, I guess my stance, I would like to hear what you think too, John, my stance on it is that I think you can bring the horse to water, 
In other words, I can stand up here today and I can talk to you about different forms of perception, aesthetic perception, creative perception, da -da. and we can talk about consciousness and we can talk about different theories and ideas about that. We can talk about contemplative practice and contemplative inquiry. And I can bring the ideas to you and I can show you, I think one of the reasons I work with the carnivores and stay with the carnivores is we, our projections are so clear, right? They're just so crazy. Um, you know, with trees, it's not as easy. I think it's just as relevant, but it's not as easy. So I think we can demonstrate to people and we can help ex share the ideas, but I truly believe it is an individual experience. And I'm actually really excited about the fact that it's an individual experience because, um, and, and there's a couple quotes that actually, uh, oh, can I read this? It's really good. <laughs> It's really good. I just, I, oh, thanks so much, Ken, for asking that, because I get to read this now. It's a poem by Rilke. Whoever you are, some evening, take a step out of your house, which you know so well. Enormous space is near. Your house lies where it begins, whoever you are. Your eyes find it hard to tear themselves from the sloping threshold. But with your eyes, slowly, slowly lift one black tree up so it stands against the sky, skinny and alone. With that, you have made the world. The world is immense, and like a world that is still growing in the silence, in the same moment, you will grasp it. Your eyes, feeling it subtly, will leave it. And then this is Robert Bly is writing afterwards. Rilke says clearly that the problem is to leave, and this is so not a way to do a poem, you're supposed to let it affect you, and, right, but in the interest of time. Um, Rilke says clearly that the problem is to leave the house, and he's using leaving the house, of course, as a metaphor, right? Your form of perceptions, your ways. But the human beings are eating of eaters of consciousness, hungry for it. Why leave the house if you're convinced if you're convinced there is consciousness only inside your house and inside your own species. Rilke's poem says that if you make the effort to use your entire imaginative power to begin to see one tree, you've essentially granted the whole world its being. Giving yourself to that one tree is crucial. Rilke in this poem is describing a practical way to heal the Descartes wound. It, evolves, it involves imaginative labor, and that labor cannot be done by the collective. Each person has to do it alone. So, but you've got, you know, I, I do think it is ultimately an individual. And, and, but, but what I want to say about what I think is so positive about that is that because it's an individual journey in the end, what happens? I mean, this is my very naive experience in the place that I am so far in this. My experience is that I can't show you. I wish I could. I wish I could bring you to it, right? I've learned this through studying you and, and doing my own, my own inner work on the level of consciousness. I've explored and, and discovered this extraordinary world, you know, boom, down the rabbit hole. But I can't, <laughs> I can't give it to you. I can try to tell you about it. But what I think is great about that is that I think it addresses our problem of fundamentalism, our problem of evangelism. Because if we really started to cultivate this, maybe we'd stop going around and killing each other because we don't get it. Because we'd realize that it's everybody's where they are on the path kind of thing, right? That's the goodest. So, yeah? Yeah? Um, so kind of going off that, how do you, how do you suggest we apply this Practically. Right. <laughs> it's great. I knew I was going to get the question because that's the, that's the, and that's, it's not, a, this is not a criticism at all. Remember, and as well, but that's the rational mind going, okay, that's fine. That's great. I really like it. I get it. I kind of, but how do we, but like, how do we make this work? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the reality is, is that it involves time. It involves incredible commitment to time and rigor. And so, I, you know, I struggle too. I think what I think what you're pointing to is we're in a we're in deep doo doo here. Like, do we have a lot of time to sit around and meditate? You know, I I think Joseph Campbell said. Are you all familiar with who Joseph Campbell is, mythologist? He said when he was asked by Bill Moyers, you know, um, well, should everybody get in, get involved in studying myth? And he said, no, you got to do what you love. Do what you love. 
follow that path. Do that. Do it to its utmost extent. And you will bring something different to the world. Um, how do you, if, if I, I think like, you know, so let's take Charlie for example. Charlie just was in love with Bear since he was a very, very young boy. And that's where he went. Charlie showed people that you really can coexist with grizzly bears. You gotta play by certain rules. Mm -hmm. um, but you really can come to a different way if you do the practice. But it, he's 70 years old. I don't think that probably helps, does it? <laughs> I am Jack. Yeah, I'm yeah. 80 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, John, what do you think about that? How do you apply it? How do you take it out there and... No, I, I think you underestimate what you're doing, too, because it's not just one level. I mean, it's, it would be mm -hmm. nice to sit with wolves or bears. Mm -hmm. But uh, education, stories, yeah. uh, poems, they, uh, they help us open up in a different way to things. So mm -hmm. we might not hang around with bears and so on, but we can hang around with trees and bushes. Right, and right. And, uh, sorry. We have a tendency uh, to, to uh, look for reciprocity with things. Mm -hmm. We do this with people. And uh, one of the things that is kind of crazy, we do this with pets. People have pets of all kinds. And uh, with a pet, you are able to be reciprocal with another form of life. But unfortunately, most of the time, we personify the pets. We, we can only relate to them when we make them look like us. Right. Whereas the, when you go to wild animals, there's a different kind of opening. Mm -hmm. There's a deeper kind of reciprocity. Because you, uh, you have to let go as you said, about the ideas that you have or the images that you have. And so, especially with things like wolves and grizzly bears, it makes you, you know, carnivores that might eat you. Um, you have to step back in a way, and the kind of reciprocity you discover is on a different level. In other words, if I have a dog, I can be reciprocal with the dog to the degree that it can approach me and be like me. Whereas if something that's really wild, I have to open up on another level. But, but all, these, all these things are, are going on. Um, you know, just the picture, for example, it encourages a kind of openness. The stories that you tell uh, encourages a kind of openness. So it's not like you're either on with an animal or off with an animal. Yeah. It's the kind of language you use with animals, with natural objects. Yeah, you're in relationship. I think, you know, it's practice. And I think, I guess my, my answer to your question is, fine, try. Find what you love. It takes a lot of time sometimes. And go go for it with your heart. And like John was saying, it's not one single thing that you'll do. It's sort of the, the multi multiplicity of things that you do. And you you don't know how you touch people, you know, or how you bring uh, the, this, this, this way into, into um, what's the right word? To, to give it more validity. Practice, I guess, is, my right, is what I would say. Practice. <laughs> Good luck. It's really hard. <laughs> May I have a few words, please? Well, sure. You know, I just want to, because I know the okay. students have got their exams. I'd love to talk with you. Um, but I know they've got their exams and their papers, and so I want to make sure maybe if any of them have any more questions or comments. or, Yeah? Well, before they take their exams, my message is oh, okay. uh, is, is, uh okay. to them, okay. too. Sure. And I ask your approval. Oh, sure. Of All course, right. of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to... Uh, I've come here to say, since you are in the position that you are in, in your years now, you're letting the world know, as you travel, how you feel and how you think sh things should be. And you get to the point where there's, it's, it's wonder, there's good mm -hmm. and there's bad. Mm -hmm. I, I have been with animals all my life. When I was 17, I walked 30 miles just to learn to train a dog to Boston Mass. I really wanted to learn, but what I had to discover as the years went by is that it was all ready here. Mm -hmm. And in my work over the past years with aggressive animals, whether they be grizzlies, but in particular grizzlies, I and uh, the wolves. I knew the wolves when I was a little girl. All right. One has to learn, in my estimation, how to be one. It is the animals that will tell you what they want and 
what you should do. They have been in my dreams, my visions, my astral projection for years mm -hmm. and years and years. I was guest speaker at the Maine Wolf Coalition one year, and they began to tell about all the wonderful work that they had done with the wolves. We were in a building. We were by the river. And I said, why don't we go outside and stand by the river, by the mother? Because I would give you the advice that if you really want to help the wolves, you better let the wolves tell you. And how do they tell you? God in heaven sends them to me and lets me know mm -hmm. what's happening, what the animal wants. I'm getting ready to go back to Montana, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I don't sit down and say, well, grizzly bear, will you come to me? Or mm -hmm. black bear, will you come to me? No. But a week ago, the grizz came, because I had been there for three years. The grizz is walking west. He's already told me, get your bags packed and come back here. Mm -hmm. My whole life is geared by what they show me and tell me, mm -hmm. not what I want from them. Mm -hmm. well, now, I think one last thing yeah, I might yeah. add. A lot of people have died. I specialized for years in bear attacks. And I don't want to tell anybody in here how horrible it is when the bear gets through with you and you're not here anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it's your duty right now with this message that you're giving is to be able to make people aware if they don't have that respect for these animals, as he said, that are wild. Mm -hmm. And I've handled many, many, I've, I've trained dogs for police work. Mm -hmm. I've handled animals in aggression. I know both sides. Yeah. I know the hot well, and think all. I'm so thank you. And that's... you need to make people aware that because they're in here listening to you now and all of the wonderful things that you're saying, there is a point where they have to learn how to respect these wild animals. Right. I think that's a very good point. Thank you for saying that because we, I, I spend a lot of time on the sort of the more philosophical pieces, right? To, and I think that's a very good point because if we've been able to talk a little bit about Timothy Treadwell and his story. That's right. Um, what happened with Timmy is, is very complicated and I don't know him. I've met a lot of people who do know him. Charlie knew him well. Um, and Charlie was frustrated with him because exactly what you're saying is that, you know, bear is a bear and, and we didn't get to talk about the idea of when you withdraw the mystery, I mean, I'm sorry, when you withdraw the projections, you have the mystery of the individual. And the reality is, is that a bear is a bear is a bear. And so Charlie would say to Timothy, and so did many other people, put electric wire up around your fence, carry your bear spray or your flares. And Timmy crossed a line, and, and this is where the psychological piece comes in. This is where the unconscious comes in. I think, personally, from what I understand so far, it seems to me that Timothy Treadwell was a person who was in need of so much emotional, so, um, what's the right word, everything, that he put that out onto the bears, and he wanted to unite with the bears in a way that made him lose his respect for what you're talking about, that these are individuals, and they are, they are separate from us, but they're not, um, it's not that we can't have, as one of you had said, we can't have the essence in the relationship, and this is what Charlie talks about, but it's a very subtle dance, and this is why I really, you know, Bill, I was going to do the course on this this spring, and Bill and I had this email back and forth, and John was involved in it too, because Bill said, oh, but you're talking about the unconscious, and you're talking about perception, and do you think you could knock that out and just get to Goethe and, and Zions and go on? And this is why I said no to him, because this is such an important piece. And I don't want to be in front of a class where some young person has gotten encouraged to go out there and hasn't brought this respect that you're speaking about. So what's the difference between him and Charlie up in Alaska right now? They're trying to prosecute because he has bears, both black and grizzlies, coming in. Oh, this is not Charlie Russell she's talking about. This That's is another right. Charlie. Charlie Russell. There's a couple of Charlie Russells, okay, in history. 
Right, right, right. This so is a different person. It's he may be killed by one of these bears before it's over. I don't know what's happened yeah. in his court, yeah. but I do know the bears know him, and yeah. he knows the bears. One of the things I'm experiencing, though, and I, I, but I want to see if anybody has any questions. Does anybody have questions? You ready to go? You done? <laughs> One last thing I can tell you about this piece, though, is that, you know, there are these sort of crazy stories. And I wrote to John and Bill about this, too, when I was working on this, is that um, I think these people are rogues. It's not always pretty. You know, when they first started to open into the world, Freud and Jung and all these guys working into the road of... Um, psychology and the unconscious, there was all sorts of horrible things that went on, right? They slept with their patients, they did all sorts of things, because there weren't rules to the game, in a sense, and there wasn't a rigor. Um, this piece, developing this intuitive, sensuous perception, bringing forth this idea of contemplative inquiry, going to, to the natural world with this approach, rather than your factual, looking just for data approach, requires an incredible rigor and a practice and a patience, and a respect, and that's why it's too bad we didn't have time to go through um, Zion's contemplative inquiry pieces, because he talks about this. Now, he's not specifically talking about it in relationship, obviously, to carnivores. He's really talking about it in relationship to, to everything, human beings, the natural world, everything. But this is a very, very important piece, and to respect that the individual, whatever you're dealing with, is an individual, and they exist in the form they exist in, and you've got to respect that and know that and have, um, it's the problem with the New Age movement, right? It lacks rigor. It's not that it's not, they're not under real things. And these guys who do some crazy stuff, like this guy Charlie, I, I, this is a different Charlie than the Charlie I know. The Charlie I know is from uh, Canada. This is a guy who has the bears all around his house and all this stuff. Until I meet the guy, until I go, I'm not making any judgments. Seems like a pretty crazy situation. But the crazy sometimes really show us the way, people, because they step out on the edge. It's not, I'm not saying don't step out on the edge. I'm not saying do it, but you might be one of them. Um, you know, look at Van Gogh. Look at, you know, look at everything that's been pushed, that push, has pushed our consciousness. It's always been the ones who've been really uh, turned up inside. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with this, I think. So thank you all very much. I don't want to keep you in <laughs>